Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Cynthia Tomain with Interactive Brokers, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar presentation on using median lines and pitchforks for high probability trading. Now, with us this afternoon, as many of you are aware, we have Tim Mort, who is a favorite among uh, some of our webinar participants. So we're thrilled to have Tim back with us here today. Now, Tim is the president of Blackthorn Capital and has taught um, <clears throat> seminars and webinars for professional traders for both the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, as well as the Chicago Board of Trade, and also discusses regularly how to successfully make the transition from market makers on the trading floor to the electronic traders. So with us, uh, yes, Tim is a legend. Yes, indeed, Wayne. So without any further ado, let's go ahead. I'm going to put this on Tim's presentation, pass the ball over to Tim, and we'll go ahead and get underway. Uh, let me make sure I pass you the ball. There you go, Tim. Let's get started. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, Cynthia, thank you for having me. Uh, I wanted to give uh, tell, tell hello to Rob. He usually does a great job of introducing me, but he's apparently busy, so that's okay. I'll get him next time. Um, I wanted to also, uh, she's not here, but uh, a fine lady by the name of Barbara Schmidt-Bailey uh, facilitated this originally, and she has now uh, left the CME group, uh, so we're all going to miss her. And uh, she did a great job over many years uh, facilitating a lot of these great presentations. And uh, many of us that were lucky enough to speak at these types of uh, uh, webcasts uh, were, were invited because of Barbara and introduced to people like Cynthia, who just does a great job of giving out great education. So thank you, Cynthia. I appreciate it. Thank you all for taking the time to come. I know you're all busy. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, put on something interesting here for you. So what we're going to talk about today um, are median lines. Um, they're one of the few leading indicators in the market that you can trade with. And uh, I'm going to try and give you a, a brief feeling for the history. Then I'll try and give you a brief feel for the basic of media lines. And then we'll go through a couple trades. And then we'll answer some questions. We're going to try and pack all that into about 45 minutes and then some questions. And uh, at some point, Cynthia actually is, want to go, is going to want to go home because it's an hour later where she's at. Um, so let's see what we can do here. So... Uh, trading with median lines, it's a simple and powerful methodology, and I'm going to start out, as I always do, uh, giving the people uh, that invented these things uh, their credit and their due. Um, this was invented in the mid-1920s, long before computers. It was invented basically on yellow scratch pads uh, and pencils and a lot of graduate students at MIT. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at it. It all comes down uh, to uh, the first person who took a look at uh, mathematical methods. Uh, at the time, if you, if you can wander back to the early 1900s, there was a lot of mysticism going on, and there wasn't a lot of science going on. This is just about the time that science, science was rev being revolutionized by, peop revo revolutionized by people like uh, Albert Einstein, uh, inventors like Alexander Graham Bell, people like that. And uh, it had started to bleed over into trading, but it really hadn't in the, for the most part. So there were still a lot of people that were looking at very mystical methods. Um, and the, the quasi-science or quasi-math that was going on at the time really wasn't uh, reliable or repeatable. So the people like Alan Andrews later on uh, in four or five years that would, that would come along, there were real scientists uh, that went to places like MIT that took a look at... Um, what methods people were holding up as mathematics, uh, would take a look at the methodology and say, well, this isn't mathematics. This is voodoo. It's not repeatable. There's nothing here that I, you know, if I change the scale, the angle changes, which is meaningless. So, you know, it's, it's smoke and mirrors, if you will. It's pen and teller in, our, in, today's, uh, in today's language. So um, we're going to start with Roger Babson because Roger, Roger Babson is, is the spawn of all this. And what he did was he had a very small forecasting firm and what he believed was he was a devout student of uh, Sir Isaac Newton's work. And in particular, Babson's original work depended entirely on Newton's third law of motion. And it's very famous. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And along with Professor George Swain, also at MIT, he was the engineering department head at MIT, Roger Babson developed the Babson chart, which is what you're seeing in front of you now. And it focused on a, back, a basket of uh, commodities, and then he studied the shape or the actual volume of the areas, so these black areas below and above, and then back below and then above, and then below and then above. And what he said was, with the action-reaction theory, if you looked at the volume 
of these areas, then when price closed back above and started to build volume above, this volume should be equal to this volume. This volume should then be equal to this volume. So if you had a long protracted area of expansion, it wouldn't be as great an expansion, but it would be long and protracted. If you had a deep recession, it would be a deep recession, but it wouldn't be as long, so it would be over quickly. So that was his basis of forecasting. And people would come to him. Um, you know, he only had three employees, so it was a very small firm. Uh, people would come to him and look for three- and four- and five-year forecasts. And so people that made buggy whips, literally buggy whips, would come to him and say, hey, I'm having a great time these last three or four years, and I, I've got five employees, and I'm thinking about adding two more. Should I expand and add the two more, or should I relax? And he would take a look and say, well, we're getting near the end of where the volume marks we should turn. So if I were you, I would think uh, we might have a retracement coming back in. So I think I probably would hold off from expanding. And that was really the basis of his type of forecasting. So along comes somebody in the mid-1920s by the name of Alan Andrews, fresh out of MIT. He goes to graduate school. His father owns a place called Frank Andrews and Son. Alan is the son. And uh, Alan graduates from MIT. His father wants him to become uh, a trader or go at least into the stock brokerage business. And Alan has absolutely no interest because it is non-mathematic, it's non-scientific, it's non-verifiable. But what he does like is uh, a seminar that we have today would be a Friday night dinner at somebody's uh, house. It would be a social affair. And then you'd invite somebody like W. DeGan, Roger Babson, uh, R.N. Elliott, somebody like that, and you try and outdo each other because in the 20s, everybody was in the stocks. And so he would go on the Friday nights because he was a bachelor and there was free food and there were nice-looking young ladies walking around. Um, and he'd have his free drinks and have his food and walk around. And he'd listen to the uh, whoever the speaker was that night, and generally he'd get two or three sentences out of the gentleman or well unfortunately there weren't many ladies back there doing technical analysis but uh, we're going to these parties to as speakers but whoever was speaking he'd listen to them for two or three sentences and then he'd go oh, this is the same old hooey it's not it's not anything i can verify i'm not interested it's why i hate the stock market it's why i hate trading it's why i hate all this research never mind i'm just going to go eat some more food one day much to his surprise he walks by a gentleman and the man's talking about baskets of commodities average prices a moving average, he's talking about calculating the volume, which is calculus, above and below a moving average, and he's dumbfounded. He says, you know, that sounds like mathematics, it sounds like physics, it sounds like thermodynamics, it sounds like the stuff I do in my lab. I, I, they can't be. So he gets another drink and he comes back and he listens to him some more. And basically he listens to his entire presentation that night, and he decides uh, he's going to spend some time talking to the guy. So he goes and talks to Roger Babson. And they have a 15- or 20-minute conversation. He asks if he can come over and see him the next day. So Babson says, sure, of course. So he goes over and sees Babson the next day at Babson's office, and it becomes a, a long-term friendship and relationship. And the first thing he asks Babson is, you know, it sounds to me like you're working with mathematical uh, concepts, moving averages, uh, volumes, uh, areas above and below moving averages, center moving averages, all kinds of interesting things. You know, I can do research on all those things, um, and, and I actually happen to be a, pro a uh, professor of uh, thermodynamics over at MIT, which is where you went to school. Um, would you mind if I did some research on this? And if so, I need to ask some questions. Babson was completely open. And so for the next four years, Andrews did a lot of research uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Anderson, who was the head of mathematics then at MIT. And they got some graduate students, and they did a lot of research on uh, Babson's work. And then, oh, I'd say in the late 1920s, they called Rob Shre Roger Babson and asked him to come to MIT for a presentation. And they, they, they got him over there for lunch, and they, they took him into the uh, room where they had the poor graduate students in their uh, yellow legal pads working. And uh, basically, what they said was, uh, well, we've got good news and bad news. Which would you like to hear first? And, you know, like most of us, he said, well, tell me the bad news. And they said, well, the bad news is your forecasting method is basically noise. It doesn't mean anything. And, you know, he was crestfallen, obviously. And he said, oh, well, then what would be the good news? And they said, well, the good news is we took a look. And what we figured is that if you take a look at the major peaks in price and look at alternating pivots, they're much better indicators they actually lead price and have a mathematical probability associated with them. And we can show you a way to draw things that will give you the real probability of where price is going. 
and that was the beginning of Media Lines. And I I own this paperwork, all all this all this uh, all this research that they did, and all the papers that they presented to Babson, and all the work they did afterwards. And it's fascinating. Babson, uh, rather than fight it, Babson actually took a look. He had an open mind, uh, which he showed his entire life. He ran for president one time, for example. Uh, he was not afraid to try new things. He took a look at it and he said, wow, this looks magnificent. I, I like this, so show me more. So he became an active participant in the research rather than saying, no, I'm going to continue to do it my way. And um, his forecasting got uh, much more accurate after that, even though he continued to publish these Babson charts. In fact, these Babson charts are still published by uh, Babson, uh, the Babson Corporation, um, which is now the great-great-grandson of Roger Babson is now on the board of directors, so there's a Babson back at Babson Corporation. So you can still get Babson charts, but you know they're I think they're probably worth about what they were worth, worth then, which is not much. Anyway, uh, Babson, at one point, uh, on September 5th, 1929, he was giving a speech at the annual National Business Conference, and it rocked the markets. Um, he was the first guy to come out in the middle of this huge bull market and say, you know, you better pay attention. And here's what he said. Sooner or later, a crash is coming, and it may be horrific. Factories are will shut down. Men will be thrown out of work. The vicious circle will get in full swing, and the results will be a serious business depression. Now, Babson's prediction was uncanny. He further said, any market slide would soon start a stampede to safeguard profits. Investment trusts will begin to sell because, uh, contrary to market myth, they, they would always support the market. Um, they would protect their earnings. And on hearing this, European brokers would then begin to sell out their customers' American holdings. And then the general public will begin to sell, and margin, and margin accounts will be forced to be closed out. And, quote, there will be a stampede for selling which will exceed anything that the stock exchange has ever witnessed. Now, Babson made this warning according to the reports in the New York Times. And then he said, wise are those investors who now get out of debt and reef their sales. News of his prediction received by Wall Street traders by the mid-afternoon that day caused the market to retreat on the close by 3%. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot today. 3% is not that big a move today, but back then, that was huge. And this first major decline in the stock market in 1929 became known as the Babson Break. In late October of 1929, Babson took out a full-page article in the New York Times warning that a market crash of unprecedented scale was at hand, and he urged those investors to liquidate their holdings. By midweek, the market was in a panic, and the following Monday, October 28th, the sell-off turned into a route. More than 9.2 million shares, again, it seems like a little now, but back then it was a huge amount, were traded that day, and the losses from that day alone was well over $14 billion in 1929 dollars, which is... $14 billion then is several trillion now, the greatest one-day drop in history uh, for the stock market. And in fact, by Tuesday's close, the big board had lost more than one-third of its value since the high reached on September 19th. It eclipses. Everybody thinks 9 was a huge drop. This, this absolutely destroys uh, the, the type of equity loss that we saw in, in, uh, uh, on 9 Let me show you another chart here. Um, I'm going to go ahead for one second. I'll come back to the other one in, in just one second. Um, the third person involved was a, a man by the name of George Marischal. There's very little known about him uh, publicly. And it took me a long time to figure out just where he fit in. But this is a very famous chart. It's the one thing that's public uh, and that all of you now, uh, that all of you actually can, uh, you can go look at the copyright office. You can go look at the New York Times. This was published. He copyrighted it, and he he and Alan Anderson and um, Ro uh, Roger Babson were all pretty well tied in with the president, with four presidents. Um, and they were asked when FDR got elected, uh, he, he had fired three sets of financial advisors, and uh, he asked basically at some point, uh, "Is it possible for one, for you three guys, since you did so good at calling the downturns, can you come and?" and give me your view of uh, how to turn things around and how to uh, get this economy headed in the right direction uh, because I, there's nothing I can do. It just seems like the economy is just spiraling out of control. And the truth is uh, Alan Andrews and Roger Babson saw no merit in going to see the president. They saw no upside at all. 
But for some strange reason, George Marischal decided it was a good idea, and in front of you, you can see the chart that he produced before he went to CFDR, and then he had to copyright it. And he produced the chart right around here and then copyrighted it. And it's a 15-year quarterly projection. I mean, pardon my French, but to have the balls to make a 15-year projection is just incredible. Then to copyright it, I don't know why you would copyright it, um, but then even more incredibly, I put the actual Dow Jones down here underneath, and you can see how he captured the major pivots magnificently for 15 years running. It's just unprecedented. It, it, I couldn't do a six-week that was anywhere near this accurate. It took me, a, like I said, I own uh, the charts that are behind this. Um, I don't have the copyright uh, uh, approvals yet, to, unfortunately, to publish. It's not self-fulfilling prophecy, unfortunately. Um, it's just median lines behind it. And what he told the FDR was, look, if you just relax and be presidential for four to six months, this thing is going to turn around. Just look at this chart. And when it turns around, it's going to come out of the hole like a rocket. And you're not going to have to worry about the economy anymore. Then you're going to have to worry about how long you want to be president. And that's exactly what happened. Look at the way it turns around and take a look at the Dow Jones. It follows, it follows his predictions absolutely magnificently. And if, if you knew what was behind it, if I could show you, it's actually just a straight median lines. There's rumors that the cycles or moon spots and all these other goofy things. It's just really the use of action reaction lines and median lines. And it took me a long time to try and understand where Marischal fit in. And, you know, actually what it turned out to be is, if you think about it, we take it for granted that charting programs like ID offers or like eSignal or Ensign or any of us, all of us can produce magnificent looking charts. I actually still hand draw charts. What he brought to the table, what George Marischal brought to the table was, he was a magnificent chartist, probably, in my opinion, and I own tens of thousands of hand-drawn charts, um, He, as well as my own charts, which are nowhere, nowhere I don't think, anywhere near as, well, as good as his. But um, I think he's probably the greatest hand chartist that ever lived. And I think that's what he brought to the table. This was the ability to show and, uh, Andrews and Roger Babson, as they did research, uh, the meaning of, he brought it to life, the meaning of what their charts, uh, of what their predictions meant in terms of charting into the future. And uh, I, th I think basically that's, that was his role. And I think it's hard for us to understand how important that is because for us, we take charting uh, for granted. But back then, there were no computers. So the only charting was hand charting. And he charted as well as he any computer charting program ever. Now let me back up and I'll show you the Alan Andrews study. Um, I'm gonna fast forward um, a number of years to 1965, Alan Andrews, uh, after they all made money, Alan Andrews managed money for Joseph Kennedy during the crash. She made over $450 million in 1929 dollars in 18 months for Joseph B. Kennedy, which in today's uh, dollars is about 12 or $13 billion. Um, he made about $58 million for himself. Uh, Marischal made about $50 million, and uh, Babson made 55 to $60 million. Took that money closed Babson Forecasting and started Babson College, which is now Babson University, for his three daughters because he didn't think there were any universities for women at that time that were good enough. So uh, at one point, uh, Andrews decided that he didn't want to work at uh, Frank Andrews anymore, and uh, he closed, his father had retired. He closed Frank, Frank Andrews and son, and he took a job as the head of uh, mathematics and thermodynamics at the University of Miami. He kept his house on the East Coast, but he moved down to South Miami, um, which is where I met him. And in 1965, he ran a small ad in the uh, Miami Herald, which you can see right down here. And um, basically, um, it's, what it was is he decided uh, all these years from about 1945 to 1965, he kept trying to get the dean of the uh, University of Miami to allow him to teach the undergraduates how to do charting how to do technical analysis, how to use the simple methodology, so that as they earned their money, they would be able to buy dips and sell rallies rather than buy and hold and get destroyed like everybody else. And the university would never allow him. So finally in 1965, he took out this little, little ad in the back of the uh, Miami Herald, and it said basically, uh, you know, Alan Andrews is selling his course, it's uh, 61 pages, and at the time it was $1,500, which in today's uh, 
dollars is quite a bit of money. And yet there were enough people around that remembered him from the crash that on the Tuesday at 9.30 in the morning when he said that he would open his doors and begin to sell his course, people were around the block two and then stretched out for two blocks. The police came. And they came because they thought he was doing something illegal. So uh, the Miami Herald sent a uh, group of reporters. They took pictures and they you know, ran a full-page uh, spread on the front page saying, noted Miami professor, University of Miami professor arrested uh, for uh, illicit activities. And, of course, that isn't what happened at all. As soon as he explained it to the police, the police said, oh, well, never mind, and went away. But the, but the Miami Herald printed what they wanted to print. And back then they didn't print retractions. So he was outraged. You know, he was a uh, college professor in town, and he felt that they had impeached his uh, good name or an opportunity's great good name. So he demanded a retraction. They wouldn't give him a retraction, but what they did do is they ran an interview with him. And the man that they sent to interview them thought that he had uh, Andrews cold. At one point in the interview, Andrews said, anything that has anything to do with numbers, I can chart. The man said, anything? He said, sure. So the guy said, horse racing? He said, sure. The guy said, weather? He said, sure. Do you have a weather forecaster? Well, the man from the Miami Herald said, yes, we do have a weather forecast. He said, then I challenge him to a weekly weather forecasting uh, contest for the next two years. Every Saturday, we'll just publish our, our forecast for the next week, and let's see who's better. That'll, that'll, that'll fix your readers. So this is just one of the excerpts directly from the Miami Herald. That's where I got it. You can go get it. Uh, you can go get them. It ran for two years. After about six months, the weatherman was begging the Miami Herald to please stop the contest because Andrews was killing him forecasting tops and bottoms for the, for the next week. And, and he couldn't figure out what he was doing, uh, that the radar, et cetera, et cetera, that they were using in the 1960s, uh, that was more accurate. And, and he was just using media lines. But it's amazing to me that that many people would remember him from the crash, first of all. My, it's sunny in Miami. Well, it's snowing in Chicago. We went from 85 to snowing. So um, I've shown you Marisol's chart. That's basically the three men behind, and they worked together. Um, they refined these techniques, and they did it at a time when uh, most people didn't have phones. Most people had outhouses. There was no air conditioning. Um, there were certainly no computers. There were no calculators. Uh, most people didn't even use slide rules. And for the most part, uh, they used yellow legal pads because I happen to actually own the paper, and they used uh, sharpened pencils. And, you know, a lot of times it would take them literally – uh, days and days to answer a question because if you want to take a look at a 20-day moving average and project it out 10,000 points, it takes a lot of work to do that. And that's, and that's what they were trying to do at the time. So let's take a look at uh, median line basics, and I'll show you what Alan Andrews showed Roger Babson. And uh, you can get your first test of median lines. Some of you, some of you already know a fair bit of uh, median lines. I noticed some of the names on here have been around for a while. So here we go. This is our first look at a median line. They're always drawn from alternating pivots, high, low, high. Or they can be drawn from a low, a high, and a low. This one's drawn from a high, a low, and a high. And the median line should be thought of as a line of force, and we expect price to oscillate around this line of force. And it's going to do two things for us. As price moves forward in time or space, depending on whether or not you're using a time-based chart, it's going to show us the probable path of price. And so once we have the median line, it tells us whether we're in an uptrend, a downtrend, or in consolidation, if it was straight across. Then we want to find out where it's going to run out of energy on the upside or the downside. And to do that, all I did was I drew a line here. And you can see off this high parallel, this high pivot C, I drew a line that was parallel to the median line. And then I connected it to C, so it's parallel to the median line. That's where price should run out of energy to the upside. Similarly, I drew a line off of the downside pivot. And when price oscillates around the median line, it should run out of downside directional energy at the lower median line parallel, which is parallel to the median line and off of the lower pivot B. And that's the basis of median line. Uh, let's look at some of their applications and rules. What Andrew said after looking at all the research, and one of the reasons he was so excited, <clears throat> was that in his testing, 
When price comes off this upper median line parallel and starts to head lower and starts to take out these lows, with 80% probability, it will reach the median line. Very important concept. If it breaks through this median line and starts to head lower and take out lows, it'll, meet, it'll reach the lower median line parallel with 80% probability. If it was coming off of this, low, this median line and starts to take out highs, with 80% probability, it'll meet, reach the upper median line parallel. And all of that is based off of just these three pivots, the high, low, high. So it's a leading indicator. It gives us where price should run out of uh, energy to the upside and where price should run out of the downside. And it also should give you the probable path of price. Let me pause here for one second and let me just say one thing. Uh, people are asking some questions. I'm not ignoring you, but what I'm going to do is so that we, we only have an hour, what I'm going to do is a lot of the questions you're asking will be answered as this unfolds. Then if they're not, I'll go ahead and take them at the end. And if we have to, we'll back up and move, move to a slide, okay? So 80% of the time, price will come down to this median line, and we'll, let's work with that. Now, I've verified this statistically over every commodity traded in every time frame uh, you can think of and non-time-based chart that you can think of now that computers and computer um, technology and computing time is so cheap. Um, I started in the early 80s to computerize it and test it and do statistics. Recently, a man by the name of Greg Fisher, who also was on my forum, uh, got, did his doctoral thesis on this. And, of course, uh, he was at a major U.S. university, and they thought he was crazy and didn't think he would be able to show anything. Um, he was able to actually uh, verify not only the statistics uh, that I showed and Andrew showed, but he was also able to show some of the statistics uh, that, I, that I quote on the uh, uh, high probability entries that I use, like test and retest and zooms that you're going to see some of them in some of these trades, um, he, he's focused on the grains in his dissertation. And you, you can actually go see it on the Median Line website and read his uh, uh, doctoral dissertation and take a look, and you'll see the statistics. He'll show um, that he gets a very similar number uh, for testing the median line or the next probable line. And you can see also the probability of the entries that I use. Um, so it's nice that other people, there's also uh, Dr. DeLoga in France has done uh, some great statistical work as well to verify some of the methods that I use um, as well as some things that he uses. Uh, and Greg also uh, is quoted well there. So there, there are now, I, I can truthfully say in the late 80s when I first started to, do, to publicly do this, and certainly in the mid-90s when I uh, started to open a forum before the word blog was invented, um, I was standing out there all by myself. Now there's some other people doing some hard, cold statistics showing that this is a leading indicator. It does work. It's very interesting, um, and it's very good. Um, here, let me, let me type in the median line website. It's www.medianline.com. Hopefully I can type. There we go. Now, once price comes to the next probable line, and in this case it's the downsloping median line, Andrew says with 80% probability it'll reach this line. When it reaches it, it'll do one of three things. It will either stop and reverse, which you can see it did here. It's median line. I can't type. And at the end, you'll be able to see it um, on a link from Cynthia. There you go. Um, it'll either stop and reverse, which it did here, it'll congest, or it'll accelerate through. And here you can see price came to the median line, tested it, stopped and reverse, started to take out highs. That means with 80% probability, it's heading back up to this upper median line parallel. Here you can see price accelerated or gapped through the median line. And remember, back in those days, they didn't have live price feeds. You got your prices at the end of the day or in the morning out of the New York Times or whatever paper you happen to look at, and then you drew your charts by hand. Similarly, news came out, and uh, we got a lot of gaps because prices didn't trade 24 hours like they did now. So what would happen is, you know, the, the stock market would close at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, News would come out at 5. At 9 o'clock in the morning, you'd read your newspaper, drink your coffee. The market would be just about ready to open. And you'd say, wow, look at those earnings from, uh, well, Intel wasn't around. Look at those earnings from uh, uh, American Railroad. And you'd get prices lower. 
on the opening. So there were a lot of gaps, and this would be acceleration. Today, now I'm going to adjust this chart. Today, instead of a gap, all I did was I connected it. We call those zoom bars or wide range bars. And you can see that price on the news opened higher than zoomed and ran right through here. And what Andrew said was, Uh, again, all, all of this will be, if you have questions, just be patient. All your questions are going to be answered either at the end or as this unfolds. So let's pay attention here. In the median line, we have a wide range zoom bar. What Andrew said this is going to be important in a few moments for an entry is, if for some reason you didn't have your stop in or you didn't have a stop or reverse in either one, Price will come back 80% of the time and retest the line that it just zoomed. And here you can see price came back and retest the median line. And take a look. We're going to call that a zoom and then a retest. And we're going to use that as an important entry later on. Now, one of the things that Andrews was noted for was uh, and I believe in this, and I, I, uh, the people I mentor and the people I have in continuing education can certainly attest to this. One of the things that I, I do, I got from Dr. Andrews, um, and I absolutely agree with this, which is if you have an idea, do the research and present it. If you're right, we'll, name, we'll go ahead and show it and popularize it and use it. These are tools. They can always be improved upon. The markets change. The markets are dynamic. Um, and if there's other ways to use these tools, we would, we would love to know how you use them, how you've personalized them, how you've mastered them. There's more than one way to use these tools. There are hundreds and hundreds of ways. That's why these are not curve fit, like, uh, you know, there's not one setting. Uh, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, RSI or some of the other things that are so popular. Everybody's looking at the same thing. There's many ways to draw these. There's different median lines. Uh, there's different time frames, so this is never going to be something where uh, people are going to have trading programs that can anti-median line. We've tried to reverse, you know, there's turtle soup, for example, is a famous, uh, a famous non-entry, which was built to take care of the Richard, Richard Dennis clones. Um, we've, we've paid people to, that are very good at it to try and reverse engineer an anti-median line method, and it just, you know, it's not doable, even with today's computer power. So this is a gentleman, uh, an Armenian by the name of Dr. Hagopian, who was also from MIT, and he uh, attended Andrew's uh, classes at Andrew's house in South Miami. And he came in one day and he said, uh, if price comes to the median line 80% of the time from the upper median line parallel, what about the other 20% of the time? And Andrews cavalierly said, I don't care. Because I, I'm a stop and reverse trader, so if I... If I'm short up here and it comes down and it doesn't make it to the median line and then it goes through the upper median line parallel, I'll just stop and reverse and get long. It's okay with me. I've still got a small profit, and I'll catch a move to the upside. Well, it wasn't good enough for Helgopian, so Andrew said to him, well, you go back and tell me to see if you can find something. And so Helgopian went back and spent four or five months, and he came back and he said, I did find something, and here's what I found. If price travels from this upper median line parallel toward its most likely line, which is the median line, and doesn't make it, and it's taken out some significant highs and lows, it's taken out, in this case, some swing lows, you can measure how far it's come down, flip it over the top, run a line that's parallel to the upper median line parallel, the line that it was using, and it'll give you a magnificent target to use when you trade. And sure enough, you're going to see in some of our examples that we use it all the time. We use them as sliding parallels intraday, but you can also use them as, I, as Agopian did here, which is just to flip over the exact same amount. Um, it'll give you a great, uh, a great target. And we see these over and over again, and this is one of those tools that is vastly underused. People ask me, how often do I erase old median lines when price comes through? Let's take a look. I've got a blue upsloping median line set, and price was doing pretty good with it. But price comes down here now, closes below it, tries to get back above it. You can see we have two, two touches here. Tries to get back above it, cannot. 
most people would erase this blue upsloping median line and just have the red downsloping median line, and which is a good median line. Look at it get gets tested here, gets tested here, gets tested here. So it's certainly calling the shots when price breaks through this blue upsloping median line. The red line is clearly in charge. Price comes down, tests the median line, the downsloping red median line. When it turns back around, let's think about Hagopian's rule. We would measure how far it's come. We'd put that on top of the upper median line parallel. You would expect that this is likely to come out of the hole and rock it up to about this area. You'd certainly be, at minimum, be looking to sell the upper median line parallel, but with Hagopian's rule, you'd probably be looking to sell up in here. But what did you run into? You ran into what was support and is now resistance, the upsloping blue lower median line parallel. If you had taken that off of your chart, you would never have seen it coming, and you would never have seen the test and then retest to get short. So sometimes it's important to have that last, at least that last, if not last couple, big median lines that we're calling the tune because they do come back into play. This is one of my own inventions, and we've done a lot of statistics on this. Uh, in the past five years, it, and you're, I'm showing it more and more for a long time. I kept it to myself uh, as we did statistics because I wanted to make sure it was real. And what it is is uh, there's, there's two words, confluence and energy point. Confluence can be two median lines or a median line and a lower median line or upper median line parallel. It can also be any one of the median lines, and then it can be a Fibonacci sequence number or it can be a trend line, um, any, anything like that, where they uh, – uh, run into each other. Energy points have to be lines of opposing force. One has to be downsloping, one has to be upsloping. Now they have two interesting characteristics. And I always, when I see them on my chart, I always just draw a big circle around them. Big, I call them dumbbell lines. I just draw a big circle around them and say, look, if price gets in this bomb site, I want to pay attention. I want to know. Why? Because they tend to act as price attractors. Price tends to get drawn into these energy points. And it's not that price is going to, to change in trend here, but when they get drawn down into these, ener these energy point areas, price will either, they very seldom congest, they either stop and reverse or they accelerate through and you, have, you do have a chance to enter. So when price gets into these bomb site areas, if I don't have a position, I want to pay attention. If I do have a position, I want to snug up my risk or maybe even take my profits. So I circle them and I want to know they're there. And one last thing, um, besides Agopian, there's another very famous man by the name of Jeremy Schiff, S-C-H-I-F-F. -F. And what he, he was a bottom picker, if you will. He, uh, even though he was a trader on the New York Mercantile Exchange, um, he liked to trade stocks and he liked to buy bargains. And what he wanted to know is if, stock, if, if, if a stock was in a vertical uh, fall and it lost 80 or 85% of its value, how do I know when it's time to pick a bottom in the stock and go long. And the, reason, the problem he had was if you draw a traditional median line because of the, you've gone from normal volatility or regular size bars to these wide range long bars, the median line is very steep and very skewed and price drifts out of it very, very fast. In fact, if you drew a, a normal median line, you'd already be through it in this area right here. You, I mean, by the time you drew it, price would already be through it. So, so uh, as soon as you go from normal volatility to abnormal volatility, think of, for example, right after the jobs number in the morning or something like that, uh, traditional median lines often uh, are not particularly useful until the volatility settles back down because the statistics and the probabilities are done on normalized volatility. And the way to think about that is uh, it would be like trying to measure a grain of sand with a yardstick. Um, you need to use something that's, you know, a tool that's, fit to the same volatility. And if you change volatilities, you have to change the, the scale on the tool that you're using. So what we do for a shift median line, um, shift asked Andrews the question, and what Andrew said is, well, go back and do the research and come back and tell us. So, so he did. He came back about six months later and he said, I think I get it. What I think you need to do is you take the A point and you move it halfway down between the A and the B point. And he would put his A point here. Andrews took a look at his research and he said, I got an even better idea. Move it halfway down and halfway over, and now you're in business. Now you've got a, a change slope in the value in the line, but it has the same mathematical predictability um, when you had this vertical-type movement, 
and it'll still give you, it'll describe price for you and give you where price should run out of energy on the upside and the downside when price has made these vertical type moves. So when you see these vertical type moves, put in a traditional median line and then make it a shift median line by moving it down a half and over a half. This is particularly good in vertical moves. And it's also, we don't know why, we've been doing a lot of research uh, for the past three years, and I can't answer the question, but I will tell you right now, if you trade foreign exchange futures, you know, cash FX or uh, FX futures on the CME, either one, shift median lines are uh, just wonderful. So uh, if you trade either one of those, pay attention to shift median lines, learn how to use the tool. Um, they're very, very good. They describe action quite well. So let me go to the next slide and see where we are. So now we're going to actually look at some trades. Uh, we're going to look at uh, CME FX futures. And we're going to look at uh, a chart here. This is a 15-minute chart of the Euro FX currency futures. And you can see prices in a very nice downtrend. Now note that when I drew in this traditional median line from the first set of high, low, high, Somebody's asking earlier, how do I pick the pivots? Look, I just drew the major high, the major low, the major high, and drew the median line. Now, you don't have to know much about median lines to take a look at this and say, well, thanks, Tim, that's real useful. That really didn't do much for me. No, it doesn't. It doesn't describe very well, price very well, does it? Because it, it, we immediately skewed out of it, and all the action is above it. And that has to do with uh, prices moving forward. There's not enough going on, and price is moving on, and it's pushing – pushing the action to the right, but the median line is still stuck here. So let me show you a technique that I use to take care of that, which I recommend in a lot of markets. Tick charts are one, yes. I take time out of the equation, if you will, and this is an eight-tick range bar in FX futures. What that means is each one of these bars has eight ticks from the high to the low. And as soon as it breaks that range, it'll print a new bar. And you can see it describes price much better. Much better. And I get a touch here, I get a touch here, I get touches here, I get touches here. I've got much better price action. I've got a lot of interaction here with price, a lot of ability to make trades in here. So by taking time out of the equation, and by the way, this is the same high, low, and high as the previous one. The only difference is I've taken time out of the equation. Now I'm looking at space, if you will. Uh, Ensign, e-signal, neo-ticker, uh, in some instances, trade station. Almost everybody does some nine time-based charts. They don't do all of them other than neo-ticker and Ensign. Neo-ticker and Ensign do everything. Um, so let me show you this side by side, and maybe you'll get a better feel. Here's a time-based chart. Here's a non-time-based chart. And you can see, at least in this application, range bars do a much better job describing price action over the same period of time as 15-minute bars. Yet the same amount of action has gone on, okay? So let's look at, these, uh, at this actual trade. Let me turn my page to get caught up here. So we're going to look at an actual trade in Euro FX currency futures using median lines. Again, this is an eight-tick range bar chart of the Euro FX currency futures. Price made a near vertical fall of nearly 150 ticks, and then it rallied in an orderly stair-step fashion up here. I can clearly count five alternating pivots in this move up. One, two, three, four, five. It's a dirty count. I'm not trying to do... Um, Elliott wave uh, analysis where, you know, A has to be 38% of the whatever. This is very, very sloppy. This, you can count this as five or seven, but there's at least five waves here, or five pivots. That tells me to be alert that price may, may have finished its move up at any time. So now I want to take a look. When price breaks below the swing low, we're going to look over here. I'm going to zoom in on this in a second. When price breaks below a swing low and then closes below triple bottoms, I draw in a red downsloping traditional median line, which is what you see here, high, low, high. But remember, somebody asked before, how do I pick the pivots? 
This is just off the major high, the major low, the major high. Nothing special here. I like the price tested here and worked. I like how price climbed up here. I mean, I do take a look at these things after I draw them to see if it even describes price in any way, shape, or sense. Note that the rally did not make it to the prior high at A. C is lower than A. That makes me feel even better that this is down sloping. I don't know if a top is in, but if it is in, I'm trying to project the probable path of price if a downtrend is, otherwise, is underway. If price makes a new high, I'll simply erase this red line, okay? Now I'm going to draw in a second line. Looking at the same price action, I had a green downsloping median line that is much narrower in scope because the red median line may act as a good big picture set of lines, but it's probably too large in scope to be entirely useful in intraday trading. Price just may not interact with this larger median line enough for intraday trading. Now I've got a new one off of this major high, the major low, the major high. Then I think to myself, well, I had this, ver this large vertical drop, and I just told you that if I have a vertical drop, I should use a shift median line. So what do I do? I take the A point, I move it down a half and over and a half, and I turn this traditional downsloping red median line, let me show it to you again, into a shift median line. And it shows me long term the oscillation of where price should go. Short term, I've got a traditional median line. It shows me where price should run out of energy to the downside and the upside. Between the two of them, I think I've got it pretty well covered. So now I have a major red downsloping shift median line and a narrower green downsloping traditional median line. I think I'm going to be able to project the probable path of price if this market has begun a downtrend. Let me zoom in. Nothing has happened yet. All I'm doing is coming closer. I've just zoomed in on the charts. So you can take a look. When price breaks these swing lows, that's when I'm drawing in all this. Okay? Note that I marked an area of confluence. It's not an energy point because they're both downsloping, so it doesn't meet that criteria. But it will still act as an attractant for price, and it's still an area where I want to pay attention. Let's see what we get. Price comes down, tests the downsloping median line, green median line, turns on a dime. So with 80% probability coming off the upper median line parallel, it should make the median line. It certainly made the median line. And what did it do? It can do one of three, three things. It can reverse. It can accelerate or congest. It turned on a dime, started to head higher, makes a high, comes down, takes out the swing high, so it's making higher highs and higher lows. So now it's stair-stepping higher. So I know this green line, at least, has some validity. It's been tested once now. I don't have a trade idea yet. Don't get, don't get concerned. You haven't missed anything, if that's what you're thinking. Now price stair-steps its way and comes right back up. And for the, I get the first test of the downsloping upper median line parallel. And look, price tests it, but then closes on its low with what we call nice separation. This is your, the first use of the term separation. Separation is a concept that I coined um, after teaching people at the CME and the CBOT and seeing, some, seeing them take some trades that um, uh, I would not take. And after doing some research, I realized it was because I was paying attention to the actual action, price action, during the bar as it clo uh, closed, and I wasn't teaching that. So we did some research, and then we started to teach in the seminars, and we found that this, along with teaching more about context of what the market is doing with swing highs and swing lows, makes a huge difference in your trading. And people that are taking mentoring with me, um, it's one of the things that we just pound day after day is context and separation on these tests and retests uh, and these trade entries. And it makes a huge difference in, in passing uh, on trades that don't have good context or don't have good separation. It will keep, keep you out of a lot of trouble. So this green median line has been tested twice now. Down here, price held. And I love the way it held up here and closed on its lows. 
excuse me. I think price is in a downtrend, and now I have an idea for a trade. Let me diagram it out for you. So here we go. Because price tested the green downsloping upper median line parallel and closed with great downside separation, it closed down here, I want to sell a retest of this downsloping median line, upper median line. This is the area where price should run out of upside directional energy, and here are my orders for this potential trade. I'm going to enter a limit sell order where price will intersect with the upper median line parallel, and that comes in at 144.36. If price lets me, I'll be selling a retest of this line. At the same time, I enter a limit sell order. I'm also going to limit my potential losses by entering a stop loss buy order at 144.44, which is seven ticks above the high of this test bar. Also note that it's above the prior swing high over here, and it's above here. Below the current price action is the area of confluence I pointed out earlier, down in here. If price is really in a downtrend, I do expect price will be drawn to this area of confluence. So I'm going to place my limit buy order, my profit order, at this area of confluence at 143.86. I'm risking seven ticks on this trade to make potential 50 ticks, assuming that the market lets me get filled on my entry order, and that's a risk-reward ratio of 7 to 1 which is a very good risk-reward ratio. I personally never take trades with risk-reward ratios of less than 2 to 1, so this more than meets my requirements. I double-check my orders, then I place the limit sell entry order and the limit stop loss order into the market on my electronic platform at the same time. I never enter a sell order or a buy order without putting a stop loss order in the market at the same time, ever, ever, ever. I always limit my risks. Now, remember, I can't enter a profit order until my entry order gets filled, however. Price trades a little lower. And you can see all I'm doing is I'm running my cursor down this downsloping upper median line parallel. And you can see I actually had to move my order down by one tick. I checked again where price would intersect with the upper median line parallel, and I moved my order down one tick to 144.35. My limit sell order was filled as the next bar unfolded, getting me short at my price at 144.35. As soon as I saw my price print, I checked the audit trail on my electronic platform to be certain that the exchange sent me a confirmation that my sell order had been filled. Then I double-checked that my initial stop-loss order at 144.44 was in the market. I entered my limit buy order at 143.86, right at the area of confluence I circled earlier, and I made this limit buy order contingent with my stop-loss order. That means that if one of these two orders gets filled, the other automatically gets canceled. These type of orders are called OCO, or one cancels the other. If your platform does not allow you to use those types of orders, you'll just have to do it manually. When price breaks several swing lows, you can see here, we broke through these swing lows. Back up one, I'm sorry. Nope, I guess not. Getting down to 144.15, I have more than 20 ticks in this trade, and although I don't have a market formation to hide this new stop behind, for example, a prior swing high or double tops, I have a vertical movement. I can't help, I can't let this trade turn into a loss. I've got too much profit into it, so I cancel my initial stop loss order at 144.44 up in this area, and now I go to break even. So now I'm working a break-even stop order, and the most I can lose on this is brokerage, which for me in the current season is about 550 a contract. You can have my brokerage, but you can't have anything more. Price continues to trade lower, trading below 143.95 before beginning to consolidate in a classic energy coil or con uh, uh, consolidation area. And to do that, for it to be an energy coil, it has to have five touches. And you can see I've got one, two, three, and I've got double bottoms here, so I've got five touches. That's an energy coil to me. When price forms a third top at 144.10, 
I cancel my break-even stop order up here. I've got so much money in this, I don't want it to back up too much. I cancel my break-even stop order, and I enter a profit order, a stop profit order, seven ticks above the top of the energy coil, which is also triple tops. So seven tick, ticks above here. It's right here, 144.17. I'm now going to play with the market's money, trying to box in profits as price, price works its way lower. I still believe the area confluence will act as a magnet to price. It's not that I'm giving up on the trade. It's that I've got so much profit in this, I don't want break-even. If nothing else, give me some money. I'm going to keep boxing in profits. You can see price briefly peaked above the top of the energy coil, but found fresh sellers, and my stop profit order was never close to being executed. And several bars later, price broke through and closed below the energy coil down here. If I hadn't moved my break-even stop earlier, I would have to move it now, but I've already moved it. So there's nothing for me to do. My order's where it should be. Two bars later, price hits my profit target at 143.86. Once I see my price print, I check the audit trail on my electronic trading platform. I make certain I've exchanged confirmation that my limit buy order was filled. Then I check and make certain I'm working no further orders. And then I bought and sold an equal number of contracts. Last, I actually look at the P&L on my screen. I do the math in my head, and I check to see if it's about what I expect. If there's a mistake, I want to catch it now, not in the morning, when the email shows up with my, uh, you know, my, my report of trading from yesterday, because it's too late to do anything about it then. The area of confluence acted as an attractor down in here, pulling price right to it. I see areas of confluence and energy points do this over and over in all markets, all time frames, whether they're time-based or space-based. They're very powerful areas to recognize and use in your trading. I netted 49 ticks in this trade, which is 612.50 per contract. Although price may continue to head lower, areas of confluence and energy points can be places where changes in trend occur, so I prefer to take my money off the table and watch, and see it, uh, watch until I can see how price reacts in this area. I can always find another trade area. If I'm flat, I double-check that I'm flat. I pull all orders. And you can see the area of confluence does indeed act as a magnet, and then a change in trend occurs right at the test of the red downsloping shift median line. Five bars later, price breaks and closes above a prior swing high. I'm happy to be on the sidelines with some profits in my pocket. Now I can watch patiently until I have a good idea where price is headed. Right now, I'm still mildly bearish. But before I'd even think about getting short again, I need to see a strong sign of weakness to signal that this is a retracement in a downtrending market and not a major change in trend. Take a look what happens. We start to take out highs. Now we're making higher highs and higher, higher lows. Price comes up, and we get, again, a gorgeous test of this downsloping green upper median line parallel. But again, it tests it, and it closes on its low, just as it did over here. I like to say beat on the line until it beats you, so I'm not afraid to get short again at this upper median line parallel because, once again, it's shown me a sign of weakness. I would not have blindly ended in order to get short at this line because it's fulfilled its downside requirements down here by testing the green downsloping median line and then immediately climbing higher. But the current test bar and its close in particular gives me all the confidence I need. And here's what I've got in mind. I want to sell, just in the first trade, just like in the first trade, I want to sell a retest of this green downsloping upper median line parallel. And running my cursor over the chart, I can see the price would intersect with that line at 144.18 during the next bar. I'll use a seven tick initial stop above the 144.20 high of that current bar, which makes my initial stop loss at 144.27 above the last major swing high above here. Since price is now well past the area of confluence, I'm going to use the green median line as the area where I'll take my profits. So I'm going to measure this median line, and that's where I'll take my profits. Once again, before entering orders, I need to calculate the risk-reward area. I'm risking seven ticks to make a potential 43 ticks. That gives this potential trade a risk-reward of just over six to one, which is a very nice risk-reward ratio. 
I double check my orders, then I place my limit sell order at 144.18 and my initial stop loss order at 144.27 into the markets at the same time, limiting any potential loss before this trade is even initiated. Remember, I can't enter a profit order until I get filled on my entry order. And here's a perfect example why. You can see price never came back and retested this green down sloping median line. You can see I even moved it. When price breaks below these double bottoms that are also swing lows, I just cancel all orders. If price immediately rockets out of this hole now, it's come so far, do I really want to get short? I'm going to need a new sign of weakness before I'm willing to get short. This was the move down off the test of this upper green downsloping line that I wanted, and I'm not short. So at this point, once it starts out, they're actually triple lows, triple bottoms. When it takes out the triple bottoms, I don't want to be involved anymore. I often get asked if I feel anxious when I miss a trade because the market didn't climb back for a retest to let me in. The truth is I feel there's an endless number of potential trades, and being anxious or impatient or even angry when the market moves and I don't have a position on is a waste of my emotions. I never chase the markets, and if my entry order doesn't get filled, I'll just wait for the next trade entry I'll set up to appear. Now here's something real neat. You're not going to see this uh, in anybody else's work. After breaking the double bottom swing lows, price rallies to test and peak above this green down sloping upper median line parallel. But look close. Although price briefly broke above the upper median line parallel, it closed well below the line. Once again, for the third time, it tested this line and closed below, tested this line and closed below. Now it peaked above it, but it still closed on its lows. This is the third time price has tested this upper median line parallel, and all three times the test bars closed with great downside separation, which are signs of weakness. This line is doing exactly what median line theory says it should. It's telling me where price is going to run out of upside directional energy. Now here's a little twist for you that we use in our proprietary proprietary I'll try it again, our proprietary trading room all the time to squeeze some extra profits out of the test and retests when price has peaked above the line. If you look at this chart carefully, you'll see I marked the low price made in the area of confluence earlier. Take a look right down here. This is called undershoot. Notice that price didn't quite make it to the green median line. And if you look at the current test bar, it went past the green downsloping upper median line. And that's called overshoot. And it's about the same distance. When I see price undershoot and overshoot by very similar distances, I draw in a new set of lines, sliding parallels, off the low of the undershoot, and then off the high of the overshoot. I just flip it over, same amount. This new line carries the same slope and therefore the same frequency as the original median line and its parallel lines. Price has shifted by a small amount while retaining the same frequency, so it's quite easy to project the probable path of price since we're still working with lines that have been tested and held quite well a number of times. These sliding parallels are now in effect the lines in charge. And let me show you how I'm going to use them to initiate a trade and squeeze out a little more profit if I get in. I want to sell a retest instead of the green down sloping upper median line parallel of this red sliding parallel. And that's at 144.16. I'll put my initial stop loss order seven ticks above the 144.17 spike high at 144.24. My profit target will be a test of the lower sliding parallel at 143.73. Right down here. Let's work out the risk reward ratio. I'm risking eight ticks to make 43 ticks. That's a very nice risk reward ratio of over seven to one. Now note that you could have put your sell order at the upper median line parallel and put your initial stop up here, right here, instead of the, at the sliding parallel, and put your stop at the same place, seven ticks above the spike high. But you'd be risking an additional four or five ticks, and the size of the initial stop loss might make you not take this trade, even though the risk-reward ratio would still be quite high, four or five to one. After watching and researching the risk-reward ratio, uh, excuse me, after watching uh, and researching the thousands of, of these spike formations, it's become obvious to me that I was seeing a shift in price along the same frequency and that using these sliding parallels was the better entry method. 
I double check my orders, then I place my limit sell entry order at 143.16 right here, and my initial stop loss order at 144.24. And as we saw earlier, earlier, I can't put my profit order in until I get filled. Sometimes the market doesn't let you in. Let's see if we get in. During the next bar, price climbs back higher, testing the same spike high and in the process, getting me short at 144.16. Note that price left double tops at 144.17. I really like that. And price again closed with great lower separation, well below the upper median line parallel. In fact, it closed on its lows. I really like that. Signs of weakness. Once I see my entry price print, I check the audit trail on my electronic platform to be certain I have a confirmation from the exchange that my limit sell order was filled. Then I check to make certain my initial stop loss order is in the market and working. Now I can enter my limit buy order at 143.73 and I make a contingent or OCO with my initial stop loss order so that if either order is filled, the other will automatically be canceled. Price works its way lower, breaking below 144.00, and then it leaves triple bottoms in the 143.95 area. At this point, I've got about 20 ticks of potential profit in this open trade. I can't let a 20 tick winner turn into a loser so I cancel my initial stop loss order all the way up in here, and I go to break even. I'd go closer, but I don't have any market formation to go to. I want to box in profits anytime I can, but here the best I can do is break even. Price makes a new low. Prime's a bit higher than it makes a new, a new low. When it breaks the triple bottoms, which leaves me a swing high right in here, I cancel my break-even order and I put a stop profit order seven ticks above the 144.07 swing high at 144.14. I'm now playing with the market's money and I'll just keep boxing in profits as price works its way lower. Note that I also recalculated down here where price would run into the sliding parallel. It was at 143.73, now it's at 143.70, so it's three extra profit ticks if it gets hit. I'm working with down sloping lines and I'm short and that means that as price moves to the right, I'll just keep moving my profit order lower to a match where price will intersect with the sliding parallel. I need to get paid more the longer I'm in any trade because my capital is at risk for a longer period of time. Several bars go by. You can see I was able to move my profit target one more time to 143.67. And after several bars of consolidation, price spikes lower, filling my profit order in the process. When I see my price print, I check the audit trail. I make certain the exchange says my limit buy order was filled. I make certain I'm working no further orders. And finally, I check that I bought and sold an equal number of contracts and do a quick mental calculation to see that the P&L my platform is showing is roughly the match is what I do in my head. If there are any errors, I want to catch them now, not in the morning. It's too hard to make money to not catch these small types of errors and fix them at the moment. Last, note that price not only made it to the green median, median line, but it closed below it. I got out at this sliding parallel. It made it to the median line and it closed below it. It may even go lower. I get asked all the time, do I feel anxious about leaving some profits on the table? To be honest, I don't even give it a thought. I had a plan and I traded my plan. Once my orders are filled and I'm flat, I clear my mind and I wait for the next trade entry setup. I don't spend one bit of energy worrying about missed trades and I don't spend one bit of energy worrying about potential profits I might have missed. I booked the profits that my plan called for. In fact, by following the slope of the sliding parallel, I caught an extra six ticks of profit. Again, this trade netted me 61250. It's just a coincidence, it's the same amount per contract before brokerage. One of the keys was using the test and retest entry setup at the upper sliding parallel instead of at the upper median line parallel. If I had been focusing on the upper median line parallel alone, I may have passed on this trade because of the size of the initial stop loss order. Cynthia, do we have time for questions? I know I'm running a little bit long. Go right ahead, Tim. There are quite a few questions there, and I don't want to cut this off too quickly. So okay. um, I also, Tim, if I could just uh, for a moment, I noticed that the questions have come in to all attendees, and if anyone had sent any questions, the presenters or, um, cannot view those questions, 
so you will have to re-enter them. So notice if you did put a question in up above, if you would please retype it and just in that send to box, make sure that it is sent to all participants so that we can all see it and uh, Tim will be able to answer your question. Okay, go right ahead, Tim. Okay, uh, and I'll do my best, Cynthia, to remember to repeat the questions uh, so that it makes some sense when people go back and review them. I don't have Barbara here to kick me in the ankles. <laughs> so uh, That's right, yes, if you would just uh, repeat the question at, before you answer it. Okay, so uh, Achman says uh, when price sticks to the upper median line parallel or the lower median line parallel right from when the fork is drawn, do you invoke the Gopian rule and make a trade, or do you simply not make a trade yet? Um, I want price to move away, and I want it to either, if, on, if it's an upsloping line, I want it to start to take out some uh, swing highs before I get interested in a test and retest. In other words, if it's just laying right on that lower upsloping lower median line parallel, that's not enough for me. Uh, Brian says, how did I establish a seven-tick stop? Um, I want to give the the trade some room. I'm not in the currencies, and I'm into if I'm intraday trading, I don't use more than about ten uh, uh, ten ticks. Um, you know, I, I just want it to go three, four, five past uh, the formation. And this in this one, I just I just happen to use seven, but I'm not going to never going to go more than ten from my entry. What time frame would I recommend for day trading um, in the currencies? Um, I tend to use eight tick range bars personally. In the E-mini S&Ps, I tend to use 10,000 constant volume bars. Um, in uh, bonds, I use 352 tick bars. If you're trading cash FX, you can't use non-time-based bars, unfortunately, because the feeds yet are not sophisticated enough to give you reliable non-time-based bars. So I use 20-minute charts, 60-minute uh, charts, 40-minute charts, 240-minute uh, things that are you know uh, multiples of 20s. Uh, what tick minute volume chart do you recommend for trading? Yes, 10,000 contracts per bar. Um, Wayne says, uh, cheers from everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, Leon says, the biggest problem I have with median lines is to know when they will likely be exhausted. What I try to do is find a Z-score of the move. I don't know what that means. Um, so I'm sorry, Leon, I don't know what a Z-score is. What time frame would you recommend for day trading? I answered that already. Um, William says, can you explain the difference between a sliding parallel and warning lines? Yes, warning lines are predetermined. They're equidistant from the median line to the upper or lower median line, and they're projected out another degree. So the first warning line is equidistant from the median line to the upper median line parallel. The first warning line above it is the same distance out there. And Andrews would draw four above and four below. Sliding parallels have the same slope as the median line, but they're drawn off a pivot. John Martola says, uh, on the si slide that showed the interplay of the old and new fork, would you review the overshoot, undershoot, and show where you would place the sliding parallel? Uh, I'm going to come back to that one, John, because I'm going to have to, I'd have to, I'd, let me just see if I can do some more. Russell 2000, here's what I'm going to tell you about the Russell 2000. In my opinion, and it's only my opinion, and this has nothing to do with me at one, one time owning, owning a Merck seat, honest to God. Um, I trade a, a very large amount uh, of contracts. And at one point, um, I used to trade a lot of Russell. In 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002, when we had 200, 250 day, uh, 250 point moves in the NASDAQs, I used to trade a lot of Russell and I used to trade a lot of NASDAQs. The Russell has become it's a very it charts very cleanly but it's become relatively illiquid so i no longer trade it and if you ask me today i would t it's not on my trading list i don't even you know, i only chart it if somebody asks me so i stay away from the russell if you want to know what to do about the russell or about the e mini dow here's what you do take a look at the daily volume of the e mini s and p's take a look at for example the russell take a look at the daily volume then compare the two, find what the ratio is. Take 10,000 contracts per bar and use that ratio to tell you that you should be looking at, like say in the Russell, you might be looking at 1,500 per bar, for example, or 1,000 per bar. Bill says, uh, briefly review how you recalculate your sliding profit target. Do you use a standard risk to reward ratio? My sliding profit targets, no, all I do, let me, just, let me just go back to the chart here. All I do is I run my cursor down and I say price will hit here, directly down. Then as time or space moves me to the right, I run back down and I go, well, look, now price will hit here. 
as price as price moves farther to the right, okay, now price will move here. I just run my cursor down here; it'll tell me where. Uh, let's see. Will auto forks be available in Trade Station? Yes, they will be available in Trade Station. I'm working with Stan over at Trade Station. Um, we are, have a bit of a problem in that uh, Trade Station language uh, that they currently use is pretty archaic. And so, for example, a pitchfork or a median line in Trade Station is six objects. And in Ensign or NeoTicker, which uses IB as a feed, for example, they're one object. So doing the mathematics on six objects that have angles associated with all six versus doing the mathematics on one object um, would really clog your computer down. So we're working on it. Um, it's just not that easy to, to, uh, uh, to fix. When will my new book be available? My wife told me that if I give a date, she'll blow my head off with, with a, well, not with a gun. She'll hit me with a broom. How's that? Uh, but it's, a, it's just about finished, so it'll be done soon. Um, the question that I got yesterday was, I'm, I'm doing a presentation at the Denver Trading Group. We're going to be out there and uh, trading live for two days after a full one-day seminar. If anybody's interested, email me. We're going to have a great time out there. Uh, the book may be available there, um, and it certainly will be uh, available this spring or my wife will beat me to death. Um, and all of you will because people are tired of waiting for it. It's done. It's The problem is we're at 370 pages and it's too big. And we need to cut it down a little bit. Um, the, the printer can't deal with it. Translate your suggested tick bar amounts to trade station tick charts, please. Well, let me give you an example uh, to be creative. You can do 352 ticks in the bonds. That works in trade station. Uh, in the S&Ps, instead of using 10,000 constant volume bars, try 2,000 ticks. I don't, I don't have a suggestion in the currencies, but if you email me, I'll give you one uh, just to think about it. Um, let's see. Okay, um, and some people are, email, are, are asking questions privately. That's okay with me. Um, somebody says, uh, what's the relationship between median lines and action-reaction lines and toward the median line? Okay, so... Let me just explain. Action-reaction lines are like the superset of lines. Underneath them, median lines are a subset of action-reaction lines. They're a kind of action-reaction lines, as are channels, as are linear regression slope lines. All those things have their spawn in what are called action-reaction lines. The, the, the difference is median lines have a mathematical probability from when you first draw them because they're drawn off of pivots. Action-reaction lines are drawn off a center line that goes through pivots, and then you get your action line off of a prior pivot and project the distance forward. And you can project a number of them, but they don't have to be equidistant. But a lot of people can't see them. Andrew's quit teaching them because doing hand charting, it's very difficult for a lot of people to see it. We're going to be, te we're going to be teaching them in advanced seminars, um, and I'm teaching them to some people in mentoring classes how to use uh, action-reaction lines because with current charting uh, programs, it's a lot easier to teach and to see than it is uh, with hand charting. Uh, do I trade any ag markets? Oh, I make a fortune off the ag markets. Well, there are times when I lose a fortune as well, but um, I trade I trade everything and anything. Um, for example, I have a huge ag position on right now. Um, yes, the, the same. This is Mark. Uh, he says uh, good practice uh, with that for playback. I would suggest to all of you, if you have any type of software that allows you to go and do replays and practice. Look, this is just like anything else. The more you put into it, the better off you're going to get. Uh, and that's you're trading. When you trade, you're trading against. I like to think of myself as a professional and one of the best professionals in the world. You're trading against me. So you better practice because I practice. I do playbacks. I sat in front of my computer two hours before the seminar and worked on and worked on replays. And that's what I do. With, not not with all my private time because I've got a seven year old and a nine year old. But I spend time working. Um, and you should spend time. And there's some great tools, NeoTicker, Ensign, that allow you to go back. And, I mean, there's other trading programs, but I can tell you those two because I use them both, that allow you to go back and randomly play a market and then do it at 30 times speed and practice and practice drawing these lines, practice moving your orders, uh, practice looking for formations that you might have missed. I go over the day's uh, trading. You should be doing all those things. If you're not, maybe you're not serious about trading. You need to be serious. Randall says, uh, would you regard the intersection of a horizontal line with an Andrews pitchfork as an energy coil or confluence? I would, yeah. 
well, so a trend line uh, along with the Andrews pitchfork as conf- that would be confluence, not an energy coil, uh, not an energy point. But yes, it's confluence, and then I would I would look at it. I would expect price to get dragged to it. Absolutely. What about price movement? Uh, Michael says uh, against the trend. That is from upper median line uh, in an uptrend toward the median line. What are the issues? Well, if, Michael, I'm going to have to uh, I'm going to have to guess what you're asking me. Um, th- this is this has been a, been a biggie. I don't sell against upsloping lines. I don't buy against downsloping lines. And if that's what you're asking me, the reason why is you get about a 10 or 12 percent edge if you trade with the slope of the lines. On top of that, if you sell against upsloping line or uh, downsloping lines, excuse me, if you sell against upsloping lines. If you think about it, the resistance moves up, so you're going to get what we call collared. So I sell against downsloping lines, and I buy against upsloping lines. I hope that answers your question, but I'm not sure. Jim says, uh, how do we find out about mentoring programs? Email me and here. Well, try, let me go to this. Let me just put it on the screen. There we go. I don't have to type it in. Tmorge at sbcglobal.net. Um, how often do I recalculate my median line? Um, you know, every bar or so, I'll just run my cursor and say, you know, is it if it's one tick away, I'm not going to do anything. But if it gets to be two or three ticks away, I'm going to try and capture it. So it's, I mean, especially if you have an electronic platform, it's so easy to uh, stop, you know, cancel and reverse an order, not not cancel and reverse, cancel and replace an order. So just run your cursor real quick and say, well, let's move three ticks. Okay, let me change my order by three ticks. So you know, every time a bar, if they're real wide bars. And you're in a very uh, heavily downsloped. Uh, you're short in a heavily downsloping median line. You might have to do it every bar, but generally every three or four bars. Uh, do I only sell in downsloping pitchforks? Yes, I only sell in downsloping pitchforks and buy in upsloping pitchforks. That's correct. However, don't forget if you've made what looks to be a major low and it starts to turn back up, you can always draw in a new pitchfork and say, "What if this turns out to be the bottom? Now, what's the probable path look like, and what would I need to become?" <clears throat> Excuse me. What do I need to see to become a buyer? So play that what if in your mind, okay? Will I be in Vegas at the money show? I will not be at the money show. I'm sorry, Mike. Um, I will be in Vegas in November at the Traders Expo. In fact, I'll be a featured speaker. I'll also be at the uh, LA Traders Expo at on, well, it's actually Ontario, California, Colorado, or hello, Ontario, California. Um, that's the I want to say the. 18th, 19th, and 20th of June. But I'm not going to be at the Money Show. I'm going to be at the Traders Expo. I'm also going to be at the Forex uh, Expo, which is in uh, September at Vegas. So all three of those. Uh, do I use a DOM? Do you mean do I do I use the Dome? Do I use uh, Best Bids and Offers? Is that what you mean, Dina? Yes, I do. But let me just explain to everybody, if you don't know the answer to this the exchanges have what are called facilitation to trade algorithms, which means um, they want one lot traders to have an equal chance to buy uh, compared to 2,200 lot traders. 2,200 lot traders have figured out that if they need to buy 2,200, they'll probably put a bid in for 4,844, and then they have a little algorithm written that says that when I get to 2,195 to cancel the rest of my orders. So a lot of times it'll show that they're that there's 44.85 on the bid when there's really only 21.95, and that's why sometimes you go, wait a second, how did 6,500 trade? I only saw like 2,000 trade because a lot of it's fluff. So you have to be a little careful about that. Where can you get en- uh, info on the Denver uh, event? Email me. Um, there's going to be a web page up shortly, but if you email me, I'll send it all to you. Um, it's going to be very cool because I'm going to speak for actually a whole day, literally nine to five. The day before, there's going to be this type of 45 minute presentation, free hors d'oeuvres, et cetera. And then uh, Sunday I'm going to speak all day, 9 to 5, plus take questions, which means I'll probably be speaking until 9 o'clock at night. I'm going to try and get some sleep. And then on Monday and Tuesday I'm flying in two professional traders that trade uh, very, very large multi-million dollar accounts for themselves uh, alongside me in the prop room in Chicago. And you get to watch them trade their prop accounts. I'm going to trade my account. It's going to be up on the screen. Uh, we're going to trade five or six markets. 
So you'll get to see somebody else that I've taught how to trade. You'll see how they've taken this tool and made it, them, made it their own tool. They each have a slightly different trading methodology for, or twist on my methodology, if you will, than each other as well as from my own. So it'll be, it's, uh, it'll be fascinating to see two guys that make a living uh, trade uh, live using my methodology, and you'll see that they're slightly different than I am. One of them is much more active than I am. Another one is, uh, you know, a little more conservative. On top of that, uh, most of the guys that are in mentoring are coming out, um, as well as a lot of people in continuing education. So there'll be people that you can, hey, and be my guest. You can take them aside and say, is this guy full of hooey or is this stuff work? I, I, I guarantee you, um, you, you have my endorsement to go ahead and ask them. If they tell you it's full of hooey, they'll tell you. Believe me, they'll tell you the truth. How many pitchforks are on your intraday chart at 4 p.m.? Well, at 4 p.m., I'm actually proud, other, on a, other than on a day like today where it's snowing and, uh, and my son is actually at school doing something, um, I'm either out trying to play catch with them or riding bikes uh, unless the weather is bad. So there's, I, don't, I have no idea. But if you ask me at the end of the day, um, on my long-term charts, um, I'll probably have three or four median lines. On my intraday charts, what I try to do is actually blank my charts out and start out fresh in the morning. I don't try and carry them over. Yeah, John asks, uh, is my shift median line measuring points not the same as midpoint through midpoint? Um, it's the way to think about it is you go down one half in in a space from A to B and over one half from A to the BC point. So down a half and over a half. Taz says, is an energy point stronger than a confluence point? Well, yes, it does. It is slightly stronger. Um, uh, because it does have uh, lines of opposing force, um, so if I had to rank them, I would I would rank it as more important. Uh, Michael Kennedy, what resources do you suggest for the beginner trader that give a good foundation in this? At the minimum, I would go to these webinars. Then there, you know, Cynthia has given a couple. Um, the Merck has a couple that you can go view free. Just go register, look up my name, just uh, you know, Google or. Uh, actually, maybe if you Google, you'll find them. I'm not sure, but you can certainly uh, look on their search function on their website. There's three or four that you can look at from from the past. Um, there's uh, the median line uh, is up there as well as market geometrics right in front of you. And I would give you a third one, which is I'm going to try and type correctly here right now. Uh, market geometry dot com. Let me just read it. Market geometry dot com. Yes. Um, some of the uh, information there is um, the same as on the median line, the free information. But on top of that, there's a free forum there, and there's a lot of people, including five other people that study with Andrews that are in the free forum. So you get uh, another type of uh, uh, input or another group of input from people that study directly from Andrews, and it's all free, completely spam-free. Um, how are gaps accounted for with forks? Well, they're... We can get into it deeper at another time, or you can email me and I'll show you, or you can look at the website. There are gap median lines. Andrew says that gaps uh, can be counted as highs and or lows, or you can connect them and, and ignore them uh, as wide range bars. What platform will I be using for trading in Denver? The prop room uses NeoTicker with auto forks on top of it and then draws, and that's what we'll be using. Um, I'm going to fly out uh, one of our, our high-end workstations and four uh, four LCDs that will be projected onto the whole wall of this big conference room, so you'll be able to watch us literally draw real time. And on, then on top of that, while they draw, you'll get to hear me say, that's not a draw, that's not a good line, or whatever. So thank you very much, Dee. I appreciate it. Um, do I look at trader floor pivots? Uh, Barry, I don't. Um, I've done a lot of research on them, and uh, if they ever had any validity, I don't think they have much validity any longer. It's mostly noise. Thanks, Leon. Um, how do support and resistance lines figure into this? Uh, my support and resistance lines, other than tests of prior tops and bottoms, which I do pay attention to, and I'll also take a look at most of you are going to call it Fibonacci retracements or, ex or expansions. They were actually invented by Euclid in 365 BC. Um, I call them geometric expansions just to give credit to the right people, but, you know, I don't have anything against Fibonacci, but, um, you know, they're, they're a lot older than that. Um, the reason I look at them is because, so much of the market looks at those levels, 0.382, one half, 1.68, 6.18, 6.18, 1.27. Um, you know, I want to know where those are because they're major, major signs in the market, if you will. 
Um, so I'll take a look at those things as, uh, as uh, support and resistance, but it's mainly because I know other people have their orders resting there. More, most important, though, I want to know uh, market formations. What's this, where's the major swing high? Where's the major swing low? What is it going to take for me to go from being bearish to being bullish? Um, what is it going to take for this uh, market to confirm that it's now in an uptrend? Uh, that, those are things that I want to know. If I missed one of your questions, ask it again now here before Cynthia says that she's had enough and she's got to go home and have dinner. Okay, and almost everybody stuck around. I really appreciate it, guys. And actually, Tim, thank you very much. What I would like to do is I'm putting it into the chat panel right now, the hyperlink to today's presentation, that, yeah. so that if everyone um, or if anyone does want access to it, it, it is on our website. And also, I want to remind you that today's session has been recorded, and you'll all be receiving a hyperlink to the recorded playback along with today's presentation so that you can come back and review those concepts that Tim has been so gracious to share with us here today. Ah, so, uh, and actually, it looks like a good time for us to end today's event. So I want to thank Tim Mort um, most wholeheartedly. What a terrific presentation. I definitely agree with all of the different comments that are coming back in here. So Tim, thank you so much. Um, contact information is included here, and you can also get a copy of this slide uh, through the hyperlink that I just put in today's session. So with that, we're going to end today's presentation, or that uh, brings us to a conclusion. Thank you all for your participation here this afternoon, and I hope that you've been able to pull something from this information that's going to start you uh, expanding and looking at the, uh, the pitchforks and median lines that Tim has been so uh, wonderful to share with us this afternoon. So thank you all. A reminder that you can exit today's event by simply clicking the X in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Thanks all. Have a great night and trade smart. And especially, Tim, thank you so much. Look forward to having you back with us again soon. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. I, I appreciate all the time. I know it's late for you. And, and uh, once again, by, and by the way, Cynthia is one of the very few people in the world that ever gets, uh, that I ever give permission to put up a PDF. I, I very seldom let these slides out of my hands. But uh, her presentations are so wonderful. Uh, she runs such a smooth deal. And as you can see, it's really spam-free. I mean, we're basically here to just try and help you guys get some education. So I'm all, I'm all for her having the PDF. And if you want it, go grab it um, and, uh, and study it. Well, thank you so much, Tim. And also, I do want to um, also extend thanks to the Chicago Merck for, yep. uh, for sponsoring today's presentation. Thanks, all. Have a great evening.